This is a weird example because quite a few scripts were being shopped around at this point in time. Some of which they decided to go ahead and use for Season 4, some of which they would actually push out into Season 5 instead. This was one of the ones where apparently, by all accounts, and multiple people have recounted the story, the people who pushed it out, that is to say the people who shopped it out, which would be uh, J. Larry Carroll and David Bennett Caron, were like, hey, we've got this story idea. So Riker wakes up in the future and has forgotten 16 years, and everyone was just like, no, no, we're sold, let's do it. Okay, then. And so they pushed out this episode. They did have to workshop it a little bit. Several people had uncredited rewrites of this. And they kind of tried to restructure it so that the Romulan plot was originally going to be the old full plot, but then they kind of got rid of that. And then they went with kind of the original series twist on it. And, well, they did a few things, basically, as they were pushing through this. And it worked out for the betterment, I think. I do actually enjoy this episode. I wouldn't call it one of my VHS favorites. I do have to admit... Um, it is interesting that the Romulans continue to have presence, even in an episode in which no Romulan actually appears. This is, as I mentioned before, going to be a continuing element throughout Season 4 and season, and some of Season 5, kind of bringing the Romulans more to the forefront, where they will effectively be removed from the forefront right about at the episode's unification. I had a list here of some things I just wanted to jot down. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, one other thing really quick. Carol and Karen, both the, the gentlemen who decided to you know push out this episode idea they uh, apparently were brought on as story editor for a decent chunk of season four as a consequence of this script so that's kind of cool so there's a ferengi in starfleet there's a female klingon in starfleet um Jordy decides to go ahead and grow his eyes back although in this case he uses clone implants uh troy is in an actual uniform and I, I bring all this up because this kind of helps to indicate some of how weirdly predictive this episode was. Because anybody who's aware of Star Trek going forward knows that Nog does eventually join Starfleet. There is eventually a female Klingon, female Klingon in Starfleet. That would be uh, Belana Taurus, of course. Jordy does eventually get his eyes back instead of the prosthesis. And Troy does eventually get in uniform. But the one that's most interesting to me is the one that's the freakiest. This episode is, in the fantasy, it is purported that it is happening within the year 2383, and that four years ago, they started a peace treaty situation with the Romulans. Now, the specific circumstances are different, but the really weird thing is that Star Trek Nemesis occurs in 2379, four years before 2383. Huh. <laughs> I'd, I'm pretty sure all of this is pure coincidence. It's just really weird to think about when you actually... Now, now that we have the advantage of hindsight, I sincerely doubt any of this was deliberate on anyone's behalf. This episode did actually introduce something very interesting, though. It brought in Nurse Ogawa. Now, for those of you who don't remember, Nurse Ogawa is actually a fairly regular recurring nurse in the medical professional team. She's actually the most recurring medical character who isn't Dr. Crusher. She will be in quite a few episodes all the way up to and including uh, All Good Things. She doesn't even have a name properly in this episode. She gets part of a name in, I think, the next episode, and then she gets a full name later on. But I point that out because Nurse Ogawa is a fairly, you know, again, a regular secondary character or ter uh, tertiary character, if you prefer. And... Like I said, we'll be brought by for quite a bit. And it's funny that her first inclusion is when she's not actually there. It's only in the fantasy simulation side of things. Anywho. So, <laughs> uh, this is a really hard episode to talk about because it's difficult to properly nitpick a huge chunk of it since, well, oh, excuse me. Oh, oh, sorry, I'm getting tired doing these, as you might imagine given how many I'm slam slamming out every day. But it's weird because so much of this happens in the simulation. And as is pointed out, it's not quite a holodeck. It's more like a holodeck if it had a mental link control rather than a verbal link control with some of the limitations that you might imagine built into that system. You know, it doesn't quite work as smoothly as a holodeck would, but it also reacts with less of your interaction. You know, you don't have to do as much to get it to work. Um, but a lot of things I'll cover as we go through. I think the writing of the script is actually quite tight, and I'll discuss why I think that as we go through this. So there's this bit at the more at the beginning where Riker's like, ah, ha, ha, "It's my birthday, and this is awesome, and I can't play the trombone." And then, oh my god! And then, um, you know, they say, "You know, you have to make a wish. What's your birthday wish?" 
And he looks at Troy and he hesitates for just a couple of seconds. And then he recovers and says trombone le- or music lessons, music lessons. And I like that because I like to think that he was not thinking about music lessons in that moment. Not in the dirty, you know, lurid kind of way. I mean in more of a soft, romantic kind of a way. There's also a a lot of really quiet little nice touches that they do. They're down in the the thing, and Picard calls them, and Riker's listening, and he doesn't say a word. He just kind of points really briefly at Worf and Geordi and then leaves, and the two follow him. It's a really minor touch, but I do like those minor touches because they help to show how much this crew has gotten used to each other. He shouldn't have to say, you know, Geordi, will you join me on the bridge? Because they're past that point. They've been working together for at least three years now, depending on how you define it. So, then they're shot into the future. Oh my god, no, it's been 16 years. Da-na-na-na, teaser ends. Now here's the thing. I've talked many, many times about the very philosophical purpose behind a teaser, behind the cold open, and why it exists in television. The hard reality, though, is that for fans, a cold teaser has to grab our attention for the episode, but it has to do so in a way that matters. I remember when I first saw this episode, and Mum was sitting next to me. Of course, I saw all of TNG with Mum. I saw a lot of Voyager with Mum, too, and part of Deep, Deep Space Nine. And her, I remember her distinctly. The first thing out of her mouth was, Oh, come on! <laughs> yeah, I know, it's fake. And we started chatting during the the little break in between, like, okay, so do you think it's a holodeck? Do you think it's like it's going to be undone by time travel? And I'm like, no, I think it's the Romulans. And she's like, oh, yeah, they did mention the Romulans. So, yeah, this is probably a Romulan plot. Okay. And we were both just like, yeah, okay, let's figure out what version of fake this is. That is one of the few things that is a little bit of a shame about a show that basically has to maintain a status quo it inherently limits the kind of storytelling you can do. You can't really raise the stakes in a certain way because, well, those characters are going to be there next week in the same relative way that they are next week. You know, I've, I've posited many ideas before about Riker leaving the Enterprise but not the show, or bringing Thomas Riker back in, or allowing Shelby to recur, and none of those ideas would ever happen at this era in television because you had to maintain the status quo. I shouldn't say this era in television. Obviously, there were shows that were doing that, but... Paramount certainly wasn't. So there's just so many limitations on what you could actually accomplish. And so I lament some of these teasers because imagine for a moment that they really could stretch with the, with the storytelling. This kind of teaser would then be like, oh my god, what have we missed? What's going on? Instead of, okay, let's see how it's undone. So they do a lot of little touches. The set's been touched up a little bit. New panels on the bridge. Jordy's different. The Ferengi's different. Commander data in red. Funnily enough, while I think red looks really good on Worf, it doesn't look all that great on data, in my opinion. I'm curious if anybody else has any opinion on it. This is not the last time that data will be wearing the command red. I just thought I'd comment on that. So... They mentioned the fact that, you know, Riker's like, okay, you know, I know I, what's going on? And, oh, well, there's the treaty with the Romulans. Yeah, okay. Oh, and this is Riker's reaction. He just yawns. No, but the real reaction is that he is just taking all of this in stride. I think that says a lot about Star Trek and the fact that a character in-universe can just sort of accept that 16 years of their life is gone. And that's just sort of normal. Like, it's obviously a big thing to deal with, but at no point does he say, well, this is impossible, or this is crazy, or this has to be a trick because I cannot accept this as reality. No, he just kind of goes with it. <laughs> Funnily enough, there are little notes here or there, but I want to get to those in a second, because the first thing I want to mention is, why is Riker signing a treaty between the Romulans and the Federation? Riker being present at the treaty, sure. Riker being one of the many names who signs it, Okay. Why is Riker the Federation ambassador who is signing this treaty with the Romulans? Now again, we know that this is fake, so it's hard to nitpick something that is basically deliberately flawed. But I point that out because I don't know if that's a deliberate flaw or not. We know several are deliberate, and I'll get to those in just a second. But then he insists that he's unfit to command, and Picard insists, no, you're the best one for this job. This is not the first time that characters in this fantasy setting basically insist on something to Riker more or less to point him in a specific direction or to make him think or feel something that it believes he wants to feel. Remember, this is a simulation that directly responds to his thoughts, hence the nature of how it reacts to him. Riker, of course, being the captain to be the leader of the Enterprise and be at the forefront of peace with the Romulans, 
This is the kind of thing Riker would absolutely love. He is an extremely ambitious person who also likes to do things just because they're perceived to be impossible. So I can totally see that. So Picard telling him that is basically his own inner thoughts saying, no, you totally want to be the captain in this situation. At the 15 minute and 55 second mark, Barash shows up. At this point in time, he's being called Jean-Luc. Later, he'll be called Ethan. I'm just going to keep calling him Barash for the sake of simplicity. Although, actually, the person in the Barash outfit was female. But I don't know if gender actually applies to his, her species, their species. Regardless, I'm going to refer to him as a him for the sake of simplicity because the actor who plays it the most of the time is male. And that's why, and no other big reason. So Barash shows up and is just like, Hi, Dad. And what's funny is there's a sort of brilliance to his strategy here. If he had just shown up in the med bay, it would have been too much unknown too quickly, and Riker wouldn't have been able to ease into it. Instead, it hits him with all the people and characters that he is well familiar with. The crew of you know, the, crew of the bridge, uh, Crusher, Picard shows up, Troy shows up. All of that to cr try and acclimate him to this fantasy reality. By the way, fun note, and in case you thought I missed it, no, I didn't. Uh, when he decides to go to the bridge, there's a few seconds as it's like, okay, hang on. Because what it has to do is is scan him sufficiently to design the bridge for him. And it hadn't done that yet. So anytime he deviated from what was considered the normal program, the program had to take a few seconds to adjust. It simply was not fast enough to accomplish it normally. That's kind of neat, and they do that fairly consistently throughout the episode. Like I said, very tightly, very tightly scripted. So, here's the thing. Baraj shows up and is introduced well into this when Riker has had a chance to acclimate before finally being like, Hi, Dad! And he's so casual about it. There's a few missteps. It's hard to explain properly. Some people refer to Uncanny Valley, but the problem with Uncanny Valley is that Uncanny Valley is obvious. If you look at something that is defined as Uncanny Valley, it's something that you know is wrong with total certainty. By contrast, there's another concept, and I don't know what the proper term is for it, when everything seems completely normal and ordinary, except for the minute details. Nuances, subtleties, variances, and shades are just off. It's like, it's, it's not quite bullet point syndrome, because that would be closer to Uncanny Valley, but it's like a step past that, where they've done more of their homework to, to present this fiction but they haven't done all the work. They can't present the full nuance of it. Kind of like Data's comment about games of chance and poker all the way back in Measure of a Man. There's a lot of that in this episode. And this kind of comes up with the kid. Barash is completely casual about everything. And yet is so casual that he basically just takes completely in stride the fact that his dad has no memory of him. Which is already pretty unusual. There's also the fact that he showed no concern whatsoever when he, when Riker walked in, just was like, hi, Dad, despite the fact that he, based on the fiction they've create, crafted, should have been in a coma for the last couple of you know days or hours or however long it's been. Uh, I think it was days. And would have been well informed of that fact. Right? So for him to just be kind of like so casual and completely unemotional and unconcerned raises a small little flag there in the back of the mind, Right? There's a lot of little things like that. He, uh, Troy also does a couple things where she mostly avoids topics about herself and about how she moves on. You know, she decided to leave the Enterprise as a career move. Didn't get promoted, by the way. In fact, basically nobody got promoted except for Riker and Picard. And er, this happens consistently throughout the episode. Every time Riker starts to question things a little bit, something comes along to distract him. By the end of the episode, it's really obvious but at the early on, it's, it's, it's wonderfully subtle because Troy clearly doesn't know how to answer his questions, or the fake Troy clearly doesn't know how to answer his questions. So immediately shift topic and says, you should focus on the boy. Your focus should be on your son. And Riker just takes that in stride. And then Riker is like, hey, you know, can I get a record of my own thing? And the computer's like, eh. And then the kid actually comes over personally and says, hey, is this what you wanted? Again, Wonderfully subtle. I have to admit, I didn't notice that the first time through. I really didn't. It's a treat rewatching it and seeing all the pieces they laid in, you know, as part of this mystery as they were going through it. So then Tomalock shows up, and of course the music's like, da -na -na -na, death and doom, it's Tomalock. Given the fact that he's only actually had two appearances thus far, no. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-
two. No, yeah, it's two. Appearances thus far. It's funny because Tomalok arguably is the face of the Romulans, even though he actually only shows up four times in TNG, one of which he wasn't actually there. I just find that interesting because, unlike most uh, of the races, there really never has been a true Romulan face across all of Star Trek, really. Tomalak is probably the closest we've ever had. Now, it is always great to see Andreas Katsulas, although apparently he, he mentions he had weird issues with doing this episode, and his complaints are so strange I don't actually know what to say about them. Like, he said he was weird not being on screen, like all of his support wasn't there, and he just was very uncomfortable. I don't actually understand what his complaint was, and... Tragically, we will never actually be able to understand the specifics. I, I can't just ask him and say, what was the issue here? But regardless, it was get good to see him again because he's awesome. So Tom lectures up, and the episode does something clever. It tries to play a trick on the audience without actually cheating. It would have been easy, for example, for the episode to follow someone nowhere near Riker for a period of time. And, let, if you're pay, and yet, if you're paying attention, all of the episode follows Riker consistently. Of course it does. It kind of has to. The rest of the simulation literally isn't happening. That would be a narrative cheat if we suddenly shifted to someone nowhere near Riker and just watched what was going on with them as if this was the normal Enterprise. In other words, trying to get across the idea that there's nothing wrong here, audience, don't worry about that. That's called narrative cheating, when it presents information that's only designed to, to fool you in a way that arguably doesn't make sense in character. However, it doesn't actually cheat here, because the camera focuses on Data and Tomalak as they're walking away, and then we hear a ch, and then the camera immediately j jumps into the ready room with Riker. That's why it's not cheating, and that's why it's kind of brilliant in its own right, because the camera's still on Riker. He's just a few feet to behind it, but he's still in the presence of the simulation as Data is taking Tom Lock up the thing. So it still makes sense that that conversation would be happening right there where Riker can actively hear it, is actively capable of seeing and perceiving it, Right? And yet the episode still kind of has the actual literal camera focusing on those other two to help add a little bit of the, oh, it's not all about Riker thing. It's nicely done. So every time Riker starts to question things, and he starts to really start to question things, something distracts him. I've already pointed that out, but I'm going to try and point out individual circumstances because it does a good job of them. Keep in mind, he hasn't been gone from his room for particularly long, although they mention later that it's been several hours, but... There's a little bit of inconsistency in timing. All that needs to be said right now is that, you know, he goes, he tries to take care of his kid, he's called up to the bridge, and as he's up on the bridge, they receive them, or excuse me, he's called over the, to the uh, transporter room, excuse me, then they lead them up to the bridge, and then while he's on the bridge, he gets pulled over to the side, and he's like, Do, can we really trust the Romulans? And then, medical emergency, your son's hurt. And, of course, Riker, being a very fatherly figure, immediately drops everything to go take care of his son. Oh, my God, you're being pl playing Parsisi Squares? What's wrong with you? Funny little fact, this is actually the second time Parsisi Squares has been mentioned in the episode. And I'm kind of slurring the way I pronounce that because apparently there's actually multiple pronunciations and spellings of Parsisi Squares. I looked it up when I was looking up information for this episode. Uh, but this is actually the second showcasing. The first real time they really talked about it. It will become a regular sport in the future. But the first time they mentioned it was over on 11001001, funnily enough, given the connections of that episode of this one. So, <clears throat> you know, oh my god, he's hurt, what am I going to do? And Crusher pulls him aside and he's like, oh god, what do I, I I'm, I'm upset. And she's like, you just need to focus on your son. Notice that that's the third time at this point in time that one of the characters flat out said, you need to focus on your son. Or, excuse me, second time at this point, second time. So, he decides to go ahead and... Uh, what in the world? Yes, okay, sorry, making sure I had my, my notes here correctly. Notice that uh, shortly thereafter that, you know, he takes the kid up, and it's like, all right, listen, you know, I... Give me some records of me and him. And it, it does that immediately. And it's like, give me records of my wife, my, my dead wife. And the computer's like, eh. The kid once again has to come over. Barash has to intervene directly and say, here you go. And then it shows shots of it. Now, what they did here is brilliant, and I, it, I, it deserves applause as far as I'm concerned. Because it's the sort of thing that would be amazingly easy to not do. Because it's such a little thing. They actually got Carolyn McCormick to come back and do non-vocal lines for like 17 seconds of footage. 
but they actually got the same actress who played Minuet back in 11001001 in order to play the fake uh, Minuet here in this episode. Now that's brilliant because, number one, anybody who has seen, you know, been watching Star Trek religiously or, or carefully up to this point in time will be like, hang on a second. And anyone who hasn't can appreciate it if it's pointed out to them. It, as I said, I really appreciate those kind of little touches and little details, especially when it comes to long-term television. And believe it or not, TNG was actually pretty good at that sort of thing. It's funny considering how anti-large continuity they were, which I'll talk about at the end of the episode. But they were very pro-little continuity, little details like this. So actually getting Carol McCor Carolyn McCormick back was a great touch. What's funny, of course, is that Riker is watching this, and then he just sort of, his face plummets. And he just says, Min minuet that was the moment mum picked up on it she was the one who's like oh and i'm sitting there like what i was kind of young what do you want from me and then the music gets all doomy as he turns to, to to be like huh and the kid's like what what's wrong <laughs> Some, something's obviously upset here and mum explained to me and i'm like oh holy crap so they'd still explain it to audience who don't get it but it's there for audiences who do Notice that once again, as he starts to pick up on the deception, something distracts him. Hey, we need you back on the bridge. He just gets ping-ponged around the ship, if you're paying attention throughout this episode, in a way that, once again, doesn't quite make linear sense. It's, it's not out of character, but it's not quite right. So he gets dragged up to the bridge, and he's like, Huh, Geordi, what's going on? And Geordi's like, Yeah, I'm working on this thing with the engines. And that's why he calls him to the bridge, to tell him he's working on this thing on the engines. Again, not quite right. And then he says, so what's the issue with the computer thing? Uh, I'm still running a diagnostic. For 36 hours? It wouldn't take you more than four. Then he addresses Worf. Hey, where'd you get the scar from? In battle. Which battle? Which sector? Which unit? See, what has, what has happened here is Riker has started to realize the nature of the deception. That it can only gather surface details, not in-depth ones. It's easy for Worf to just be wearing a scar. But Worf is the kind of person who would know exactly where he got that scar, and why, and where, and how. But the one thing he does with data is the one that amuses me most. How long would it take us to get to sector whatever? At, you know? Data takes a moment, processes, and then says, at warp one, and the moment he said that, anybody, any, any remaining doubt that this is a fiction flies out the window. There is no way that data would start with the warp one. Why? Well, warp 1 is the easiest and quickest to calculate, since warp 1 is functionally light speed. So all you'd have to do is just figure out the distance in light years. Bam! Linear mathematics, right? But then he says, what about warp 8? 9? 10? He doesn't say 10, but you know, he just escalates, and Data just completely can't do that, even though he should be able to. And then, of course, he contracts. Of course, I can't. Don't, don't, don't even try. You can't explain that. Shut up! Just shut your mouth! It, it's a great scene! And finally, Tom Alok's like, Very well, you have found me out. What I find interesting is you can almost tell that Barash this entire time was just, Oh God, oh God, oh God, what do I do, what do I do? Uh, panic, panic. Because the Romulan simulation, by contrast, is much less convincing than the Enterprise simulation. Obviously, less time and effort was put into it because it was never intended to be a simulation. It was always intended... It was, it was never intended to be anything. It was just the backup plan. Uh, uh, he's expecting Romulans. So, here. Bam! It's Tomalock. There you go. Whew. Okay. Okay, we've got him back on track. What's funny to me is Romulans really would do this type of thing. Later on in this season, the Romulans will do something really, really messed up to Geordi as a consequence of this kind of thing. So, again, this is very in character for the Romulans, but immediately it starts to fall apart because Tomalak insists there were gaps in the knowledge of their mind probe. And Riker's like, no, there weren't. And he's right, there really weren't. I mean, there were specific nuanced details, but being able to pull, like, the location of a base? Well, that's pathetic. So then he goes out and, uh, he finds out that there's this outpost that he's never heard of, that the Enterprise wasn't informed of, that was attacked by Romulans recently, and this kid, who is real, of course, Ethan, he's now called, was a, a survivor of that. Well, that's strange. Well, okay. And then the kid leads him on the escape, which is, A, way too easy, at every step. 
they managed to get out of the cell too easily. They managed to evade the guards too easily. They happened to find a perfect hidey hole, which is completely, perfectly safe. No, really, trust me, too easily. He already has a map of the surrounding area already drawn, which is just insane. And everything's just cool. And then it's like, okay, well, let's get to the shuttle bay. Nah, they'd be able to find us. Well, we could get to the communications. Uh, that might work. But then Ambassador Tomalock, and then he slips up. Now, Riker had, if you're paying attention, Riker was already not really buying it the entire time during the Romulan simulation. But that's the official moment. He's just like, okay, yeah, whatever. And notice that, once again, keeping the pattern, the moment he starts to question, all of a sudden the Romulans find them, despite the fact that they shouldn't be able to according to the rules of the sim. And then Tomalock shows up and it's like, aha! You cannot escape! And the kid's like, we've got to get to the shuttle bay. And he's just like, no, no, I'm not playing this game anymore. So we learn the truth, which itself is actually a little bit ridiculous. This is actually supremely advanced tech for a race that was just wiped out. <laughs> But whatever, I'm not going to question that, because we just have too few details to really question that. And of course, as a, as a fairly typical Star Trek slash TOS uh, twist, the villain was actually just you know, misguided or not evil all along. And I'm willing to go with that, because this is Star Trek, and I'm with that. The ending overall is kind of okay, with one absolutely gargantuan flaw. Where the hell is Barash after this? It is never seen again. Ever. This is the final appearance of this entity who, whose biggest thing was not wanting to be alone ever again. And based on the way it's presented, it's clear that the actual literal threat, as in the threat to his life, doesn't exist anymore. And as a consequence, he could go wherever. She, it can go wherever. So why is this never a thing again? Now, I've actually already brought this up. See, let me let me rewind a moment. I just want to talk just a moment. Is that okay? Even though Rick Berman is extremely anti-serialization, a lot of Star Trek is still very strongly contiguous. And I want to explain that point, because I've heard several people uh, in polite tones and impolite tones tell me that I'm a moron for enjoying the continuity of Star Trek, or for insisting on continuity in Star Trek. In both cases, it's the same argument. Star Trek has never been contiguous. It always just ignores things willy-nilly. And there is a degree of truth to that. But at the same time, it's also kind of wrong. This is, in many ways, a, a setting continuity show, especially TNG, but DS9 as well, and even Voyager. Hell, even Enterprise, for that matter, and TOS. All of these shows, all of the Star Treks, acknowledge previous episodes when it comes to future episodes. They don't always, and sometimes things fail, but for the most part, we are supposed to expect that episode 13 happens after episode 5. Now, I know that sounds like a duh, but a truly non-serialized show, that wouldn't be true. The Twilight Zone, the original Twilight Zone, is the perfect example of this. Episode 13 has no relation to Episode 5, and therefore it doesn't matter when it happens because it's completely separate. Now, I know that certain people, Rick Berman, excuse me, really wanted to push Star Trek into this. In fact, as I pointed out before, the original intent of TOS was to be truly anti-serial. Same actors, different situations every week, like the Twilight Zone. But I bring this up because Star Trek has actually made a significant effort to be pro-continuity for most of its existence. In this very episode, we, we have fairly, se several significant elements of continuity within it. The, the previous episode, Reunion, was extremely pro-continuity. And I could point out other examples as well. What I'm trying to say is that for me, and this is just my impression, Star Trek is more pro-continuity than anti-continuity. And that makes these more glaring moments all the more aggravating. One of the things I would not let go when I was doing my ruminations of Voyager, as much as I love that show, is how much it would have a major event happen and never bring it up again. That bothered me. But I had a few people say back then, back when I was still kind of small, um, that it was my fault, that I was just thinking too highly of Star Trek, because TNG did that too. And they're right. TNG does do that, too. Barash will never be seen again. Just like the kid that Worf adopted back in The Bonding. Right? Never heard from him again. Gone from reality, effectively. 
And this is why that aggravates me. Because it's like... It's basically like 70% of the show is fully, you know, serialized and contiguous, and then the other 30% just vanishes into the ether. And if I could be blunt, I lay all of that blame on the executive producers. To be clear when I say that, I don't mean like Brennan Braga or Michael Piller. Both of those individuals have actually proven themselves over the years to be very pro-continuity. The same could be said of Ira Stephen Bear over on Deep Space Nine. No, I mean the actual executives, the guys who were basically making the real calls and the real decisions when it came to all the Star Trek shows. People like Rick Berman, people like Gene Roddenberry, people, uh, well, I don't want to get into all the names. <laughs> Tartikoff would argue, arguably in this as well, but you get my point. I've always gotten the very strong belief, especially based on interviews, which I myself have shared on these ruminations, and based on the, the way that these episodes were constructed, the way the writers themselves talked about them, the way the showrunners talked about them, I've always gotten the strong impression that it was always a command from down on high to be anti-continuity, and that the actual writers and producers of the shows constantly fought against that, and pushed for more and more serialization in their storytelling. This is especially true in Deep Space Nine, which actually started doing, honest to God, string continuity, which is something that hadn't been done in Star Trek up to that point in time, and wouldn't be done again until Season 3 of Enterprise. And even when Enterprise did it, it was because everything else was failing, and finally the executives have basically taken the hands off the reins, and the executives in charge of the show, the actual producers and the actual directors and writers, were allowed to do what they wanted to do, and first thing they did was a serialized story, which actually started turning Enterprise around, I feel like pointing out. You can see why I have this impression. Again, I do not know this for total certainty. But I thought, thought this was a good time to bring this up, because I was just discussing it today with a friend of mine, but also because this episode is a great example of that. Barrage should at least be referenced in the future. Never mind actually showing up, which would be nice too. Because this is something that should have some significance, at least on Riker as a character. And it's not like they don't do this kind of thing. We will be seeing stuff in Picard's ready room and his own uh, quarters for the rest of the show that he's picked up throughout his adventures. I mean, the frickin' flu will be a recurring thing, for God's sakes. We're not there yet, but you know what I'm talking about. It's not like they can't do that. I've been making a bit of a running gag over on Deep Space Nine about how Deep Space Nine is apparently anti-continuity, or at least anti-recurring guest star. I should be more accurate about it. The more I look at it, the more I think that that's just a Star Trek problem because of the aforementioned executive problem. I don't know for certain, but I'm starting to think that's the case. And I think that's a damn shame. It'll be interesting to see where the next two Star Trek shows go, because we know, but as of the, to me recording this, Discovery is starting season two, and that Picard show is getting working, and they've got that animated show in the works. It'll be interesting to see if they try something different this time around. Sorry for going off on a rant. Hope you guys have enjoyed. I'll see you next time.